Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. My mother was a polio survivor, having the disease in the first year of her life and being left with a deformed pelvis and right leg. She had been told to avoid pregnancy as she probably would not be able to deliver normally and cesarean section 70 years ago was not on. Well, she did fall pregnant and she was advised to terminate the pregnancy, but she refused or else I wouldn't be here today. So it seems to me that quote from Jeremiah was well applied to me. My parents met and married during World War II. My father returned to USA for discharge at the end of the war, and I was born soon after. I was baptised in the Anglican faith and reared by my mother and grandparents without ever knowing my father. My mother tried to give me all the things that she had been denied in her life, a good education, a successful career, and music. So when I was about five, and very shy, my mother enrolled me in kindergarten at St Michael's, which is a small Anglican school in Clayfield. It was a boarding school, but they also had day, day pupils. It was run by the Sisters of the Sacred Advent. Although I didn't know it at the time, of course, she couldn't afford it, but Mum managed to keep me at St Michael's by working for the Sisters, mending the boarders clothes and doing all sorts of odd jobs like that. There was, of course, a strong emphasis on religion in the school, and I was confirmed and took First Communion there in 1957. I graduated as Dutch at the school and gained the Archbishop House Medal in the State Scholarship Museum, and then I was awarded two years free scholarship at St. Michael's. So the academic side of things were pretty good too. Um, for those of you who don't know about the House Medal, it was awarded to the male and female students in Anglican schools who gained the highest mark in the state scholarship exam. Well, after the two years of St Margaret's route, still didn't have the money, so I moved to Kedrick State High to get my senior. After 10 years in all girls schools, I was rushed into a class with 30 boys and 8 girls. <laughs> so that was a bit of a culture shock. So after my senior, I was lucky enough to become a cadet radiographer with a private practice at Chermside and I met Dr James Hood who was a radiologist who became my mentor. I'm sure God had a hand in this because I was unaware of radiography until September of my last year in high school and I had in fact uh, enrolled in teachers training college. But anyway, I got into what I wanted to do. Uh, I really wanted, it was ideal for me because I really wanted to study medicine but had no money. So the cadetship let me work and study at the same time and I was in a field that was strongly related to medicine. So after graduating I went to the Prince Charles Hospital and by the age of 25 I was a senior radiographer in the cardiac area and that was the only cardiac catheter area in Queensland at the time. Again with Dr. Wood until he died in 1974. My work at Prince Charles with his sponsorship gained me another heaven sent opportunity, a Churchill Fellowship in 1974, which gave me 12 weeks travelling around the world looking at cardiac installations and learning from the top people in the game. So that was priceless. I was headhunted to St Andrews in 1984 to assist in setting up the first private cafe. <coughs> this required me to put my trust in God because we just didn't know whether it was going to get off the ground or not. And I gave up a successful job to make the change. Anyway, it worked. So that was good. After more study, in about 10 years, I went into private practice as an echocardiographer and this was more or less forced upon me because one of my workmates uh, committed suicide and I couldn't cope with it very well because I'd known him since he was a student 
and several things made me feel responsible for what he'd done. Well, in the 1960s, I turned to music. Having learned the piano for a few years as a child, I then started on guitar and sax and French horn. And in 1985, I gave up sound for ultrasound. And I did my postgraduate study in ultrasound. So I packed all my instruments away and I did not return to music seriously for 25 years. My grandfather, who had always inspired me, died in emphysema in 1970, and his death affected me greatly. After his death, his ashes were interred at St Collins Church at Clayfield. When we went to church on Sunday, my grandmother would cry uncontrollably. This crying would continue for most of the week, and then start fresh the next Sunday. And this just became more than we could bear, and I said to Mum, this is affecting all the health, so we stopped attending the church. And I continued my life with only occasional exposure to the church, but the seeds of faith had been sown in me, and my career was always one of caring for others. Well, after my grandmother died in 1989, Mum and I did not return to the church, as by then, Mum had limited mobility from post polio syndrome, and the nasty fracture in 2001 robbed her of the ability to walk altogether. We moved to Deception Bay in 2007 after 60 years in the same house at Clayfield. I needed to be closer to my workplace as a keeper in Caboolture so that I could get home quickly if Mum needed me and I retired to care for her in 2009. In January 2011, she had a heart attack, followed by five days of bleeding from the bowel caused by the anticoagulants. She became very anemic, and in August she was diagnosed with the stage four colon cancer and admitted to the French Child's Hospital. Here again, God's timing was perfect. I took her into the hospital at 10 o'clock in the morning, that night she collapsed and went into multi organ failure. The next three weeks were touch and go, and she was expected to die. It was even written up in the chart. On several occasions, we called the hospital chaplain. But anyway, she survived and underwent major bowel surgery with a 50% chance of survival. But during one of her darkest hours while she was in Prince Charles, she told me that she felt that God didn't want her. I suggested to her that he didn't have a place good enough for her yet. But I know now that he left her with me and he had arranged a future for me. Is this not a perfect example of God using frail humanity for his purposes? Anyway, after a very eventful recovery period, which took, she was in hospital for 16 weeks, I finally got her home at the end of November for Christmas and her 90th birthday. She had now lost the use of her good leg and was completely hoist dependent, so I managed to using four hoists. Unfortunately, she developed complications in mid-January. She was admitted to Redford Palliative Care and on the 2nd of February 2012 at 3am, God took from me the focus of my life and my reason for living. When I knew the end was near, I asked the night nurse to call an Anglican priest for me, and Libby Crossman came. She was only on call one night that week. It just happened to be that night. And I feel there's a slightly obscure analogy with the Easter story here, because just as it was necessary for our Lord to die on Good Friday so that we could all live, it was necessary for Mum to die on that particular night so that I could meet Libby and the fresh world of congregation and that helped restart a new life with God. So Libby performed the funeral service for me and then chased me up to join the craft group. <laughs> and there I met Wayne. He told me that a bass guitarist was needed for the band. One big problem, I no longer had a bass guitar. But I found one that I liked the look of, and the next day I was able to buy the exact same guitar second-hand at North Lakes. 
and I was going there that day anyway. So by that evening I had a bass guitar and that weekend I joined the band. That was my return to music. Exactly three months after my mum died, I woke up suddenly with a melody line and snatches of lyrics running through my head. It was still there when I got up, so I scribbled it down. Over the next couple of days I worked on it and the tune became clearer and the words developed into a new hymn. I had never written any music before, and I claim no credit for this hymn. As Libby said, it must have come from God, and I believe it to be his way of revealing his presence to me. It was entrusted to me to write down. I must have run a reasonable job because he continues to use me, and since then, whenever he calls me to, I transcribe the words and music he gives me, and the count at present is about 20 songs. So over the last seven years that I've been at the church, I have been involved in church activities like MU and parish council and aged care services and home groups and Bible studies. And of course I played a keyboard. Seven years ago, I had never played the keyboard in public. I have at times played other instruments during services. Music is my passion. And now I find the ukulele, which is not an instrument readily associated with church music, to be a wonderful instrument for meditative hymns and songs. It can almost sound like a small harp if it's played the right way. And I'm currently working on arranging some of my favourite hymns for the year. Now I'd like to read to you from a daily devotions book. Uh, this passage resonates with me and I feel it fits with my faith journey perfectly. Someone writes of sitting one winter evening at an open wood fire and listening to the singing of the green logs as the fire flamed about them. All manner of sounds came out of the wood as a bird, and the writer with poetic fancy suggests that they were imprisoned songs, long sleeping in silence in the wood brought out now by the fire. When the tree stood in the forest, the birds came and sat on the spout and sang their songs. The wind too breathed through the branches, making a weird, strange music. One day a child sat on the moss by the tree's roots and sang its happy gladness in a snatch of sweet melody. A penitent sat under the tree's shade and with trembling tones amid falling leaves sang the 51st Psalm. All these notes of varied songs sank into the tree as it stood there, and they hid away in its trunk. <coughs> there they slept until the tree was cut down, and part of it became a backlog in the cheerful evening fire. Then the flames brought out the music. This is by the poet's fancy, as far as the tree and the songs of the backlog are concerned. But is there not here a little parable which may be likened to many a human life? Life has its varied notes and tones, some glad, some choked in tears. Years pass and the life gives out no music of praise, sings no songs to bless others. But at length grief comes, and in the flames the long imprisoned music is set free and sings its praise to God and its notes of love to cheer and bless the world. Gathered in life's long summer and stored away in the heart, it is given out in the hours of suffering and pain, and many a rejoicing Christian never learned to sing until the flames king on them. This resonates with me, and I feel it does fit my tune. Well, since I have moved into the over 50s village of Kabulcha, God has encouraged me in discipleship by sending several people to me when they have had questions about faith. I have never tried to hide my faith in church activities, and I use my experiences to demonstrate what God means to me. I know that I am now much more receptive to God and look to him for guidance, although I am not always certain how to interpret his signs, unless they are clearly God moments. One night I was upset and unable to sleep. 
I was lying in bed when I became aware of bright light shining across me from above my right shoulder. There was no possible source of this light in my room. I lay there and closed my eyes, feeling as much as seeing the light. I fell asleep and the next thing I remember is waking up in the morning. When I opened my daily devotional book, the first line for the day was, my peace is like a shaft of golden light shining on you continuously. So on reflection, I now know that God has been guiding me unobtrusively throughout my life, providing me with strength when needed and opportunities as necessary. And although I have neglected him in the past, he has never abandoned me. I know I have a long way to go yet to achieve true understanding. But in the words of that beautiful song, which I also feel is a tribute to my mother, I now can truly say, you raise me up to more than I can be.